Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and I wanted to take a real quick moment before we start this episode, just thanking everybody for the continued support in 2020. You know, this year has been a year unlike any other uh, for I think everybody around the world. Uh, I hope you guys are all having a safe and happy holidays. Uh, I hope, I want to wish everybody who celebrates it a Merry Christmas. And uh, just thanks again, guys, for continuing to support the channel, continuing to view the channel. Got a little bit of a treat here for you today, as you already know by the title. War in the Pacific is back. Uh, I have a new opponent, XTRG. I kind of get into it a little bit in, in, in the beginning of this episode, so this may be a little bit redundant, but wasn't able to continue the series. So we are now playing Lieutenant Rainbow Slash, uh, another YouTuber. Uh, he's got a fairly small channel. Check him out. You probably haven't seen him before. Um, but he's done some War in the Pacific against Battle Group Gamer, another YouTuber as well. And so he's going to be our opponent picking up from XTRG where we left off. Uh, that being said, let's jump right in. Uh, Merry Christmas once again. Happy holidays. And I uh, hope you guys enjoy. And thanks again for the support. Hello, everybody. It's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are returning to War in the Pacific Admirals Edition, my play-by-email game, no longer against XTRG, but now against Lieutenant Rainbow Slash, a fellow YouTuber. Uh, if you are interested in checking out his channel, link will be in the description. Um, reminder, if you do check out his channel, no commenting on either of our channels about what's going on. Uh, we are looking at the turn replay for March 23rd of 1942. I believe this will be the same turn replay as the last time that I showed you something on the channel because while Lieutenant Rainbow is picking up for XTRG, he is not able to issue any orders until he has the save. And, you know, as of me passing the save to him, it generates the same replay as what we saw last time. So the replay is going to be the same, but what we'll see after we get into the replay and actually jump into the turn will be brand new. We haven't looked at the March 24th orders yet, so this will be our first time looking at sort of the, the result of this turn. You can see there a mine layer torpedoed off the coast of Australia, the Japanese landing at Rossell and the Tagula Island here off uh, the southeast coast of New Guinea. Both of those islands have the potential to build up airfields and Rinelli as well. All those islands have the potential to build up pretty large airfields of a size 5, so they could be a thorn in our side if uh, the Japanese get engineers forward so they can build those bases up. Uh, it's not easy. They're dot bases, so they can't as easily build those into bases. Takes a little bit more time, takes a little bit more resources. Both, all of those islands, I believe, have like a port one or port zero, so they're not great from like the ability to push a lot of supplies forward and maintain a heavy air campaign out of them. Uh, but nonetheless, they could prove a thorn in our side if we attempt to retake the Solomons or attempt to move up uh, the New Guinea coast as they'll be right there on our flank and, and we'll, they'll sort of be a barrier between us and New Caledonia, the northern tip of it, or the southern tip of, um, of New Guinea. So again, we're watching the final orders for XTRG play out. Uh, he did uh, have to uh, leave the series. He's in university right now studying Japanese, which is a very difficult language uh, to learn, and he just doesn't have the time to run two series. He's really slowed down his Dad Man series as well, which is sort of his primary series. And as a result, rather than waiting for, you know, for different holidays where we could maybe get a turn or two in or a few turns maybe in the summer. Uh, we just sort of made the decision to uh, have someone else pick up for XTRG. So that's where Lieutenant Rainbow Slash is picking things up. So I'm really interested to see how Rainbow's strategies and style of play differ potentially. This is his first time playing as the Japanese, but he does have some assistance from some Japanese player veterans who are helping him out. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see some of the other, you know, followers of XTRG maybe uh, follow on over to, to Rainbow and kind of give him some tips and, and tricks, and, if you will. Um, we are, as you a reminder, we are still holding out in Bataan. We actually haven't even really been pressed there. Japan doesn't have a ton of forces. It doesn't seem like in Bataan itself, and we still have a reasonable amount of supply to hold out there for a while. Singapore recently did fall. Um, I assume the Japanese are going to begin pivoting substantial forces into the Dutch East Indies. They've taken Palembang, but they haven't landed on Java yet, uh, and they also uh, have not yet really made a push into Burma, which is kind of where I'm expecting them to go next. Uh, we have built up a rather large cache of supplies. Ugh, and this one hurts. 
Again, I know the replay is not new, but anytime you get torpedoes going into the side of a tanker, it kind of sucks. This tanker is coming in from uh, South Africa, by the way, so this convoy right here to the west of Perth is uh, heavily laden with oil, so that's going to be a loss of about six or 7,000 fuel that won't make it to Australia, as well as a precious tanker. We just don't have enough tankers at this stage of the war. Also, with the loss of New Caledonia, our, tr our tankers from America to Australia have to take a much wider route, so I've been kind of utilizing Perth as a backdoor supply route into Australia. Um, but that does mean it's a longer transit, so it's it's not as efficient. And the the shortage of tankers plays even more havoc there, especially as you kind of get some of those reduced. HDFG10, thank you very much for the follow. You think I should move my convoy route into Perth to Dogleg much further south? Yeah, maybe, mind. I mean, one of the things that we had noticed is that it seemed like most of XTRG's submarines were on a more northerly route from Perth, like he was assuming tankers were coming in from Colombo, which we had not, or not Com Colombo, from, um, uh, from Sri Lanka, which we had not really done yet. So going directly in west to east into Perth was safe because he didn't have anything there, but it appears that that has changed a little bit. So we may have to change the, the route of our, of our tankers here. Meanwhile, Japanese attacking our battalion here that we had snuck back in toward Rabal, and it looks like the Lark Battalion there is wiped out by attrition. So we did just lose a good unit there that had been defending Rabal. Then they were pushed out, and then we kind of tried to catch XTRG by surprise and moved them back in. Um, you can see here Catherine expands airfield to size 2, Kogula expands fortifications to size 2, and Auckland in New Zealand expands fortifications to, or sorry, port to level 7. So that'll be nice. Uh, New Zealand is obviously a key linchpin in the uh, supply route from the U.S. to Australia, so to have that port expand in size also makes it easier to resupply our warships. I think a port size 7 can resupply uh, heavier warship shells um, than a port 6, so that should help us a little bit in some of our operations. We'll have to sort of re-familiarize ourselves where everything is and sort of talk about our strategies moving forward. We are trying to move reinforcements into Burma, perhaps a little bit late, but I'm going to move an Australian division from uh, Sri Lanka into Burma if I can, uh, if, if the Japanese don't close that route down with air, uh, air, air, their air umbrella flying out of uh, Malaya now or, uh, or out of, um, uh, is it, oh my goodness, I'm blanking here. Out of, I want to say Siam, but it's not Siam. Is it Thailand? Oh my God, I can't even think. Um, maybe I need to change my password too. With uh, with XTRG gone, the the password doesn't make a lot of sense. But yeah, let's take a we'll take a look at the turn now that we're in here. We can get updates on Prince of Wales and Repulse as well. So just real quick, if we go to the in intelligence tab, a pretty light day in the air, pretty light day overall. It looks like the Allies lose seven aircraft ops losses. We'll have to see what's up with that. Japanese lose one op loss, one air-to-air -air combat loss. Uh, if we take a look at the ops losses, we lost two Catalinas to ops, probably actually flying troops out of the Dutch East Indies to Burma. Um, the We also lost a bunch of other aircraft, just like one. So one Hudson 1, one Hudson 3, one A-29A. Uh, we lost a LB-30 Liberator. I know I'd been trying to get those out of Burma because I was kind of wasting them flying over the hump. They're really long range, good for recon, but I don't have any replacements for them, so that kind of sucks. We've only got like six of them. Hey, Kushin. Thanks for the, for the sub. 15 months now. And uh, yeah, Merry Christmas to you as well. All right, um, and they lost. The Japanese lost a Betty in air-to-air -air combat. Must have been doing some recon uh, and flew into a cap somewhere. All right, so I think I flew those LB-30s out of there before I started this turn. I did. So you can see we've got three LB-30s at Darwin. I really wish we got some some resupply of those damn things. They've got really good range. Um, now this isn't the whole unit. There are still there's still one in Lido and then there's one in Batavia. So we actually have a total of five. We started with eight of them and we get no replacements. So that kind of sucks. We could switch this unit over to operating B17Es, which we have a few of, um, because we've replaced units uh, with, uh, or actually no, because we are producing some B17Es or B17Ds, which are the older model, uh, which we we could also uh, we have a few of in in reserve also if we need to. 
Um, all right, so let's take a look here. First things first, actually, let's look at that convoy off the west coast of Australia. You can see here there's the one Japanese submarine moving southeast. You've got this convoy escort, the Aster, uh, which dropped some depth charges on the Japanese submarine there. Didn't really do much damage, I don't think, based on that camp combat report. We've got the rest of this task force here with the Corvette uh, Nagila, uh, which is also trying to move into Perth. These guys, their fuel's a little bit low. If I replenish, they'll take ops losses and won't get there. So I've kind of switched them over to full speed just to try and sprint them into Perth ahead of the sub, although the sub's got better speed than them. Uh, it should make them harder targets to hit, though. Uh, given that other tanker was sunk, there's no reason to have a separate escort. So we'll just move this guy back into the convoy, so now we'll have two Corvettes escorting three tankers. That's a pretty well-escorted convoy, but uh, still, he's, uh, he's hitting it relatively hard. Um, we've got some whirlaways here. They're on ASW. They're at 60%. Uh, let's set this arc west, I think. Uh, I don't usually do a lot of manual arcs. Um, random tends to tend to work okay. But I'm going to do get this here so those ships can hopefully fly under cover of air. Split the 12-knot tanker off with the 12-knot escort. Well, they're all, aren't they all 12 knot? Oh, well, the two, two of the tankers are 12 knot. One is 16. So I guess we could do that. We could form a new, a new task force here with the faster tanker to get it, get it away. Since they'll be able to move more quickly into port. Plus the subs only ever seem to attack one, uh, one ship. Skonzi, thank you very much. Five gift, gift subs. Appreciated, dude. Good to see you. Can't wait to hear what your new mic sounds like. You, you have me mic shopping as well. So, Skonzi gifted subs to Strider, Lask, Index, Gnome, Joe, 32320, Lofty Loop, and Groggy Bones. And Devonta111, thank you very much for the follow. I swear I've seen you around a bit, Devonta, yeah. um, but it's good to have you as a follower now. All right, so we are looking at having the Aster and the Marina make a run into Perth. You can see they make much better speed at 16 knots at flank speed. And then the other two tankers, the Manato Manatowani and the Pelk, uh, moving in at 12 knots. Uh, between them, there's about 20,000, well, actually 25,000 fuel that'll be headed into Perth. Uh, we, are we are loading up some supplies in a light cargo task force. These AKLs are going to go to Darwin to bring about 15,000 more supplies up to Darwin. Darwin does have road links with the rest of Australia, but it's very inefficient. They're basically through the, through the, the wastelands of Australia, so they don't get good supply that way. So we're going to bring about 15,000 more supply up to Darwin via sea. They will be exposed potentially to Japanese bombers off Timor uh, if they do have Nels or Bettys. That's why I'm sending AKLs because they're less valuable and they're smaller. Um, so they, they should be, it's less of a risk to send them if they get, if they get hit uh, on the way up there. Um, meanwhile, what else are we doing here? We've also are almost done unloading another very large, uh, convoy here. These guys had brought some supplies. They had also unloaded some troops here. Uh, I believe they came in from Cape Town here. You can see a very large convoy of cargo ships and troop transports with a bunch of Corvettes. Actually, let's do this. Let's form a new ASW task force with three Corvettes and send these guys east. The destroyer, oh, and actually two Corvettes and a destroyer escort. Let's do that because the destroyer escort is a good ASW technology. Um, so we're going to go ahead and let's change their commander, right? We want a really aggressive commander. So we'll spend one political point to put in Seth E.P. as the commander of the task force. We'll have them set to max react. And then we will send these guys west to try and engage these Japanese submarines out here, or this Japanese submarine out here. Maybe we can do some damage to them. The butchering of names has begun. Uh-oh. <laughs> At least it's ship names and not places yet. Meanwhile, we have another large unescorted convoy. Not as valuable because it's not carrying fuel, but we are bringing about 57,000 supplies into Western Australia. That should help. You can see that, you know, we pulled about 20,000 supplies out onto this light cargo task force of Perth. So we only have about 2,000 left in Perth. There's quite a bit of supply in the rest of Australia, and we can transit it all over via these rail lines. But it's very efficient, inefficient, and you lose a lot of it. Uh, to, to, I guess, just attrition. Um, so that'll help, I think, 
bring a little bit more supplies into Australia. Also, we've got another 11,000 fuel coming in from two tankers, which we snuck into Oosthaven on the west coast of Java. Um, these guys made it up there and out safely. We did. We didn't load one of them all the way up because the Japanese aircraft were starting to starting to get a little bit nippy up there. But I'm really pleased that we got another 11,000 fuel out of the Dutch East Indies uh, before the Japanese take Java. And these guys will be arriving in Perth tomorrow. So about 11,000 here, 25,000 fuel here, 50,000 supplies out this way. Uh, another, there's another task force over here somewhere. 24,000 fuel coming in from Cape Town on cargo ships. Um, over here so all told that brings us what closer closer over 50,000 fuel another 25,000 up here so that brings us up to about 75,000 fuel arriving in Perth in the next couple of days we've got some aircraft coming up here uh, additional aircraft and troops that are on the way from over here all reinforcing Australia and then on the east coast of Australia we've got another tanker coming in from the US with about 40,000 fuel uh, coming in here with five four tankers uh, and a destroyer escort from Los Angeles. So good to uh, be pumping Australia full of supplies. Uh, as a reminder, our aircraft carriers are in Tasmania right now. So uh, we have five aircraft carriers currently located in Tasmania. Um, all the U.S. fleet carriers, the Saratoga, the Lexington, the Enterprise, the Yorktown, and then the British fleet carrier Indomitable. Um, these guys have been resting in Tasmania for a few turns now to get their systems repaired and back up to, up, up to snuff. They're almost completely back to 100%. The Enterprise is needing a little bit of um, work. She needs about five more days in port to get back up to 100%, but two systems damage is no problem if we want to sally these guys out. Um, and she can continue doing these repairs in port. The Lexington will be done in three days. Again, only one system repair needed. Actually, the Lexington needs an upgrade, so she currently does have some radar, but a new upgrade would do what for her? So it would... Increase the anti-aircraft fire on the Lexington by 700. We probably should try to get the Lady Lex back to Pearl so she can do that. Get into uh, into dry dock so we can we can do an upgrade here. That would increase the overall anti-aircraft effectiveness by the Lexington by 70%. That is a huge upgrade for the Lex. So that's something we should consider maybe moving the carriers east to do that. We had been seeing if things would shape up for a carrier action potentially in and around Fiji. We thought XTRG might be lunging in that direction. Um, we have seen some surface ships up here near Espirito Santo, but I'm not sure if he'll make a jab or not. Um, I guess we'll have to give it a little bit of time, uh, but that, that it, that'll definitely be a nice upgrade for the Lex. Also, the other carriers, the Yorktown, uh, is going to get an upgrade as well. Her any aircraft fire is only 600. It's only going to go up to 828. Wow, the Lex really has good AA fire. Um, is the Enterprise also going to go up by 200? They're the same class as ships. Yeah, so all the American fleet carriers get an upgrade either now in March or next month in a few days in April. So we'll have to see about doing that uh, and, and what that looks like. Um, Saratoga would get a big upgrade also because she's also of the same class. So we really should get those guys into port so they can do their upgrade. Uh, AA fire is, is definitely vitally important if we're going to start engaging enemy carriers and uh we should really look at doing that um doesn't really give an effective uh, an accurate representation of how effective aa fire will be it may not but i mean the aa value for ships isn't perfect but even if it's not uh you know perfect uh i still imagine that having 70 percent higher aa value would be good i'm not saying it'll make the ships impervious it certainly won't uh, we, all, we don't have the proximity fuses yet on those guns, but definitely important. We haven't looked at the Prince of Wales or Repulse yet. We'll look at that in a sec. Um, I know it represents the number of weapons on board, but the more AA guns you have, the more likely you are going to shoot down enemy enemy planes. We are unloading some fuel here in, uh, in Hobart to try and get these task forces back up to full strength. I think we may leave the carriers here for one more day. I may sally them this turn. The, the task forces are in pretty good shape. Um, also, we do have the Hermes, which is sailing somewhere over here east. Yeah, the Hermes is sailing toward Raoul Island, a uh, British light carrier with no ships on board at the moment, or no planes on board. My plan was to move it over toward sort of south of Fiji and maybe pull one of these marine air groups off of Suva so we could operate some additional fighters with our carriers, give us an extra squadron to go around with the, with the carriers, although the Hermes is a bit slow. 
Uh, so we'll see We'll see what we do there. Not 100% sure. Not a lot else going on. We've got some subs that are in transit off the east coast of Australia. Um, Port Moresby obviously fell a few turns ago. We are trying to pull some of those troops that did get out of Moresby out. So you can see these guys have been driven into the jungle where their supply situation is very bad. Um, but they do still have supplies. So some of these units, the 45th Indian Brigade, the Port Moresby Brigade, they're still alive. Uh, and so I want to get as many of those troops out as I can before they waste away via attrition. So I have been using some Catalinas here, which is one of the reasons you may have seen some op losses, uh, and some S-23 Empires to try and pull those units out. We're currently trying to evacuate the 30, 53rd Australian Brigade. I'm hopeful we might be able to finish those guys up this turn. So you can see up here the load cost is down to 180. They have seven, uh, 17 or 15 support units left, no infantry squads left. The rest of those troops have been pulled into Cairns. Uh, as you can see here, so we've gotten about 11 infantry squads out, nine support, two vickers. Uh, so uh, that's, you know, that's what we're currently trying to evacuate into Cairns. And then after we move the 53rd, we'll probably start work on the D company of the New Guinea rifles. Main, well, actually, they're restricted, so we may not be able to pull them out. Well, they're Australian command, though, so that we probably could pull them into Australia. Um, they've got nice infantry squads, AIF Infantry Section 42. Those are much more effective uh, than a lot of the other infantry squads. So we want to try and pull those out. We don't have good re uh, replacements on those types of units. So we'll probably pull those guys out next. And I'm just going to kind of work down the line uh, to, to pull the units out that are lowest on supply uh, as, we, as we make progress. Although we may skip the Indian Brigade and go straight to the Port Moresby Brigade because I think the CMF infantry sections are better than the Indian infantry sections, but I'm not sure on that. I'd have to take a look at the database. Although these are Indian Infantry Section 42, so they're pretty decent also. Um, okay, so that's what we've got there. Hermes is small and old. Hermes wasn't built as a carrier, was it? I don't really know the history of it. All I know is it was historically sunk in the Indian Ocean by the Japanese uh, carrier battle groups. Um, Northern Australia, am I worried about him threatening there? Eh, maybe a little. It's not a ton of victory points. Darwin is, what, like 90 Windham is 30, Derby is 30, Broome is 70, Port Headland is 20. Um, I'd be more worried about him driving inland, but like, there's not a lot for him in Northern Australia. Yes, it would be bad to have Japanese aircraft operating out of there, but even like, even Darwin, if he, if he operated G3Ms or Nels out of there, he can't really hit anything from there. He can't hit the East Coast, which is where the vast majority of our victory points are, the vast majority of the um, factories and whatnot. He'd have to really drive into the hinterland of Australia, and he would have massive problems trying to drive in from Darwin, in from Catherine, and then supplying some sort of attack on the East Coast of Australia. So, like, he could land there. I just... It politically, it would be disastrous, but I don't think it would really have too much of an impact on the game and would kind of be a bit of a quagmire. He'd, he'd be sucking forces into something that wouldn't be very, very valuable for him. Uh, if he went for Perth, that would be far more concerning because Perth is actually our busiest port right now in Australia and our primary uh, you know, input for resources. It's also worth a lot more, but Perth would be much more concerning if he was to go around the west coast of Australia and try and land there. We do have some troops, not a ton, but we do have some coastal defense guns there also. And then the other nice thing with Perth is it's linked via rail with the rest of Australia so we could rapidly reinforce out of Sydney or Brisbane or other places like that. Um, so we'll have to see. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of resource centers in range of Darwin, but I'm not doing a ton of, uh, a ton of economic optimization of Australia, mainly just pumping fuel into Australia and then letting the economic centers in the south and east of, uh, of Australia do the, um, production. But. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that the invasion of Australia wouldn't be bad. I just don't, I'm not going to commit divisions in Darwin, mainly because if I do that, I, I won't be able to defend other more valuable parts of Australia. I do have a reasonable amount of troops. He's not just going to be able to drop a regiment in Darwin and take it. Um, and I do have some troops that are on their way to Catherine. I think I've got like a couple of brigades or whatnot that are marching toward Catherine from the East Coast. So we've got another 300 or so value coming in. So we'll have about six to 700 assault value. Some of that isn't great. Some of it's militia. Some of it's decent, though, as well. So we'll have to see. 
Um, meanwhile, more immediate concern, I would assume, would be the landing on Java, which has not yet materialized. As a reminder, our air forces on, at Batavia are actually moderately, pretty moderate. Um, we've got two good squadrons of fighters, 12 P-40Es of the uh, uh, V-6, or I guess the 6GV, or 6G-5, or whatever that is. One 6G-5, or is it just V-I-G-V? I'm not sure whether these are Roman numerals or whether there are, like, numbers uh, or uh, just letters. Uh, but anyway, we've got 24 modern fighters between Hurricanes and P-40s. We also have some nice strike aircraft now. So we've got nine B-25 Mitchells, uh, which have upgraded here. We've got 16, or actually 18, uh, DB-7s, which I think are Bostons. I think these are A-20s. So we've got, you know, over 20 modern attack aircraft to hit his shipping whenever it comes around. Um, I probably should throw some of these fighters up into cap just because I really have no idea what to expect from Lieutenant Rainbow. Again, completely new opponent. We had somewhat of a read on XTRG before, uh, but why is this not working? Oh, but but I have no idea what to expect from, from Lieutenant. So I think what we'll do is we'll set some of these guys up on a cap. So we'll set them at like, what's their aircraft data? maybe up to 15,000 feet for the P-40s, and then we'll set the Hurricanes at a higher altitude because these guys are much better at high altitude. Actually, I think they're better at altitude than the Zeros are if you get them up to like 32,000. So I think we'll set these guys up to maybe like a cap of 70 just for a turn, just to see if, he, he, his, if he's aggressive and strikes at us first or not. So these, these guys will come in at 32. I don't like the split of... Let's bring these guys up to 18. Um, yes, uh, Pistol, the game has a lot to do for turn one. There are some good tutorials on the web, but you need to give yourself some time for that first turn. It takes a long time to get set up. Um, what a lot of, you know, a lot of, I think XTRG's first turn as Japan was like nine hours. Um, that might be a little overkill if you're playing as the allies. If you're, if you're trying to just get started, one, if you're playing versus the AI, you can probably do a lot of what you need to do over three or four turns rather than doing it all on one turn. Um, because the AI is not going to punish you too bad. <clears throat> now, if you're Japan and you're trying to optimize like your initial attacks, that's not as feasible. But for the Allies, you can survive pretty okay uh, without completely, uh, you know, tailoring everything perfectly. Okay, so we're going to do some some sweeps, or I guess uh, technically some cap missions for these guys, just to make sure we don't get destroyed on the ground. Um, meanwhile, these bombers are going to continue their training for naval attack at low altitude so that hopefully I can skip bomb the enemy fleets when they do start moving against uh, against Java. The problem is most of these guys' low-level training is absolute ass, so they're not going to do a very good job when the when the Japanese come calling. But we'll see. You know, maybe we'll have... Uh, Maybe we'll have a couple of lucky hits here. They're really good aircraft, at the very least, for those kind of missions. Ground forces at Batavia, they're dug in behind level 3 forts. I'm trying to get them up to level 4, but the Dutch just don't have a lot of good engineering units to get that up. It's basically progressing 1% per day, and I don't think we're going to get another 25 days before the Japanese land in Java. I would expect a Japanese landing in the next 7 days or so. Um, now, maybe we've got the time, you know, I don't think it'll take 20 days for them to move up the island to get to Batavia, but it would be great to get to level 4 forts. I think, you know, level forts one through three don't seem to have a dramatic impact. I mean, they definitely impact combat results, but not dramatically. When you get four plus, though, it seems like they get much tougher to crack. Um, Warhawks can do okay in any shipping role at low level. That's good to know. I mean, right now I do have, uh, I need those guys to keep the airfield active and not bombed out. Because if the Japanese do focus Nels and Bettys there, they could definitely knock the airfield out. But that's good to know that maybe we could use them in an anti-shipping role. Um, we've got almost a thousand assault value for the Dutch troops here. I am also trying to evacuate some troops. So I've got, um, you can see here, there's one of the liberators. We're going to get it into Australia once it, once it fixes, but I've got some Catalinas here that are doing troop transports. I've shifted them away. So originally they had been focusing on pulling out a unit here. I think it was the SE Borneo KNL unit, but it's not on the coast anymore. So I'm not sure that they can actually do anything. Uh, I am trying to march these guys west to uh, Sampit. Maybe the port, maybe the base is unoccupied. I'm not sure, but um, I am. I have switched these units over to try and pull the Gull Battalion out. So this is a really good Australian uh, battalion of infantry 
that I had, I think, moved from Darwin forward to help defend uh, Kendari, but they were driven out. So now what I'm doing is I'm using some Catalinas to try and get these really good CMF infantry sections out because they have no supply here. They've got no supply at Kolka. Uh, so if I can pull these guys out and put them into Batavia, they'll really give a lift to the defenders here. They're 61 experienced, so they've also got not terrible morale. So they can they can be really helpful in the defense of Batavia if we can get them out. And so I'm using some Catalinas to try and transport them out. I did look at maybe pulling some of the troops out of Kuching uh, out, but the the troop quality here is a little bit lower, mostly base forces um, and then some really battered up uh, Dutch infantry sections here, but not anywhere near what the what the battalion here in Kolka is. So I'm going to try and get the Gull Battalion out via via Catalinas here. Meanwhile, we're continuing to use air transport to keep Ambon supplied, at least to the best of our ability. So you can see here we've got the Sparrow Battalion. It's another really good Australian infantry section here, um, which still has some supply. It's 79. It needs a total of 156. So it's running at about 50% supply. But then the Molkan Garrison Force and the Ambon Base Force are both adequately supplied. So I'm continuing to, to fly supplies out of Darwin uh, using some Catalinas uh, and some Sky Trains into Ambon to try and help these guys defend. Really the hope here is Ambon's a pretty good defensive position for the Dutch in the Dutch East Indies and the hope here is that we force him to reinforce here. He's got like a a fraction of a brigade here, but if we can force him to move a, another regiment, another brigade here, that'll slow him down elsewhere because he only has so many troops. You know, if we can pull a, a regiment out of Singapore and make him go there rather than Burma, that could be very helpful. Okay, so... Meanwhile, Singapore fell a few turns ago. Haven't really seen him transfer a lot of troops or a lot of forces yet. Uh, Molman claims to have 14 units. I, I don't know... How, you know, if that's really troops, I don't think he would have had time to pull troops up out of Singapore. So these could just be Royal Thai units. Maybe he split units up. Maybe he didn't. I'm not sure. But I don't think there's a super strong force in Molman yet. I have started moving my troops out of Pegu toward Molman in the hope of defending behind this river line here. Um, it is, what is the terrain here? It's wooded terrain. So it's decent defensive terrain. We've also built some very low level forts here in the, in the, um, the woods there and so we've got about a thousand assault value just shy of a thousand assault value here to hopefully slow any crossing of this river and hopefully also hold out uh at pegu and rangoon for longer once he gets to pegu the problem is once he defeats us here we either have to retreat into rangoon where we'll get destroyed or retreat north toward mandalay giving up rangoon so a further forward defense is a smart idea to that point, I am starting to try and get some troops into um, into Burma, some new troops. So we've loaded the 7th Australian Infantry Division, which is a crack outfit, and we are sending it on its way to, uh, to, Rang uh, to Rangoon. Actually, they're already on transport, so that's good. But I'm going to have them divert a little bit further north to try and keep them safe from enemy attack. Um, once they get here, they'll be within range of, well, they'll be at extreme range of Bangkok. So they'll be relatively safe in the Bay of Bengal up till the point where they get here. Um, are there any warships guarding these guys? Just destroyers. Let's do this. Let's form up a surface task force. All right, we're going to get two heavy cruisers and two light cruisers. We're going to go ahead and have them meet the task force and then they're going to merge with the task force so that way they can give them a little bit more strength in case he sends like heavy cruisers or something into the bay of bengal on a raiding party these guys will have a little bit more strength because that's a crack division i can't afford to lose that at sea i probably should have put him right into burma at first but i didn't and that was a mistake he did land some paratroopers on port blair which i think are probably low on supply now we reinforced with the viper force out of rangoon via air transport so i don't think it's likely that port blair will fall anytime soon but if he starts basing aircraft out of uh out of tavoy you know that could be that could be problematic because he can shut down a lot of the south of the bay of bengal so i have to be very careful with that i don't have any detection on a lot of these ships that are in the bay of bengal right now and um, there are some troops even in that area, some RAF groups or other things like that. So we'll have to see how Rainbow plays it. XTRG was very, very cautious uh, with regards to his um, his use of Nels and Bettys. He was not aggressive at all. 
in using these aircraft. So he had lost a lot of, I think, Bettys over Clark Field early in the war. And so ever since, he seemed to be very cautious with using those Bettys. They're really good at anti-shipping, but if he never uses them, then they don't do much. Rangoon does have a large fighter force that can protect uh, these ships for at least a day or two if the enemy does want to make a max effort to try and shut down Rangoon. So we should have at least a day or two of protecting the shipping in Rangoon. The problem is getting them into Rangoon and starting the unloading process. Uh, we could send those troops to Ramiri Island further north, uh, mind, but my concern would be more, one, is are, these amph are they set up as amphibious? They are, so we could load them over the beach at Ramiri, but then how many days would it take once they're in Ramiri to get into Burma? Like, if it's going to take a month for these guys to get further south, I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense to even send them, because by that point, you know, we may have already lost Rangoon or, or Pegu, so... We'll see. I'll let get the transports get another turn or two further east, and then we'll have to make a decision as they get closer to enemy air, air, um, air arm, armadas. Um, as a reminder, we've pumped Rangoon full of a shit ton of supply. I think that was one of XTRG's least obvious but biggest miss mistakes is the inability to shut Rangoon down. 131,000 supply is in Rangoon. And what that means is supplies are filtering east into China. Our total supply situation in China has increased by more than 60,000 from the start date, despite some heavy fighting. That's not something that usually happens, and that's because we put so much supply into Rangoon that the Burma Road is operating at a higher tempo than it usually does, which is actually alleviating what is usually an immediate crisis situation from a supply perspective in China, and, uh, and it has been very helpful. So it'll be very interesting, again, to see how uh, Ra Rainbow operates in China. We've got several key focal points up near Cyan, for example. We've got 2,100 troops or 2,100 assault value of troops located up there. Uh, the troops are also dug in in forts in rough terrain. Uh, the Japanese have a couple of units here, but probably not enough to push north towards Cyan. On the east flank of Cyan, he had one or two brigades, if, if memory serves, and we've got more than enough troops to stop any advance there. These troops are... Are they dug in at all? Yeah, these guys are level three forts. Holy shit. Yeah, these guys aren't going anywhere based on the forces he has dis he's got deployed here. So he might try and, like, flank. He could try and cut over to the rail line here. You know, maybe move these troops southwest. Maybe try and push north. I mean, he's got a lot of potential routes he could go. Um, but right now, I think the situation in China is more of a, a question of what is going to happen. And it's not really clear. Let's set these guys to combat and have them dig in. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not really sure. A lot of times the, the Japanese can run over China pretty quickly. We did lose Cheng Sha and some key bases over here, but we're behind a river line at Chikiking as well uh, with troops that are also digging in uh, with level four forts on the opposite side of uh, of the river here. So is this this base get its fort level up? Uh, we're trying to get it to level five. Once we get it to level five, we'll pull even more troops out. Uh, I also have some other troops sort of here in central China that are marching southeast, so we're going to reinforce. Quilin seems to be the one place that might be a little bit vulnerable. The Japanese have pushed pretty hard and pushed us back through some mountains here. We did get some reinforcements into the base here with level 3 forts with 1,800 assault value, but if there's one place that feels vulnerable, it's Quilin. We're trying to bring some additional reinforcements in, reinforcements in there. The 6th and 14th Chinese corps were really torn up in those mountainous areas, and so we're trying to pull them uh, southwest to reinforce to let them rest and recuperate a little bit in Luchao. But Quilin is the area that it's a little bit vulnerable. We did pull three fresh corps south, but I'm not sure if that's enough to stop the troops he's moving west or not. Um, but we'll see. We are also starting the process of moving some troops west into Burma. So we have some troops that can operate in Burma, in Mandalay, of the 5th Chinese Corps. So most of these units here, we are going to try to move into Burma. If we can get them into Burma, that massive amount of supply that's available in the theater right now will help these guys build up potentially into like thousands of assault value if we can get them all over there. So we are in the process of moving there. I do believe, I, I'd have to check the house rules. I do believe I have to change their headquarters prior to getting there. Um, but I've got a fair number of political points to do that before they arrive. And they're not out of theater yet, so I don't have to do it quite yet. Kid Pro Quo, thank you for the follow. Captain George G, thank you for the follow. USMC Snoopy, thank you for the follow. Uh, Gnome Drunsky, thank you very much for the follow as well. All right, so... That was a lot of updates. That was a lot of talking. <laughs> 
Um, I'm trying to bring some more logistics out of Abaddon. Uh, I've got a bunch of task forces operating up in this way. We are pulling more fuel, or, or we had been pulling more fuel south into Colombo, um, as well as bringing some just directly down to Perth. We've got 46,000 supplies coming in here, potentially to Rangoon. Uh, you know, I think the one thing that I may need to do here is, again, not knowing... Actually, no, we've already got these guys set to cap, so their fatigue levels are low. They're already set to level 70 cap. Um We've got Hurricanes also, which are set to level 60 cap, but they're flying at much higher altitudes at 35,000 feet. Uh, we do have some of these aircraft are going to have to start pulling out soon. So you can see these Hurricanes have to be removed by April 10th. So we're going to lose some of our punch here. One Hurricane Squadron there April 10th, one Hurricane Squadron here April 10th. So in like two weeks, we're going to lose 32 Hurricanes, uh, which is going to greatly weaken Rangoon. But if he's going to let us, if he's not going to push Rangoon for two weeks... Uh, you know, great. Uh, two weeks' time, we'll have actually three more British brigades arrive uh, in about two weeks' time. So if he's gonna, that would allow us to greatly strengthen our entire position uh, in in sort of the Burma India theater. Uh, we also do have one other aircraft group over here that we're looking at standing up here. We have a P-38 squadron that we've built up with 27 P-38s. We're just waiting for them to, to finish transitioning, getting these aircraft out of maintenance and to serviceable. So we're still about two weeks away from the entire squadron being ready, but we should have about 17 P-38s uh, in Mandalay uh, in the next turn or two. So these guys are going to be real nice to help defend against Japanese aircraft. We had to play some, fin we had to finagle some of our, our squadrons in the United States to be able to get these because we're not really producing P-38s yet. At least they're not coming into the pools yet. But we had some training squadrons with them in the States. So we swapped them over to older obsolete aircraft, pushed these aircraft into an AVG squadron, which is a really high experience squadron. You can see here, these almost the entire squadron is above 70 XP. So great aircraft, great pilots. I'm really excited to see what these guys can do um, against the Japanese because the Japanese don't have their upgraded aircraft yet either. They're still flying the aircraft they started the war with, and the P-38 can really ravage them if we get them into action. I don't even think they know they're around here. At least I don't think XTRG knew. Um, and they're just hanging out at Mandalay getting themselves ready for combat. So once he starts the push in Rangoon, either one, if we lose 32 Hurricanes, if we can replace 32 Hurricanes with 27 P-38s with great pilots, that's a fair trade. The other thing is, once he starts pushing in Rangoon, once these aircraft in Rangoon get worn down a bit, if we can reinforce with 20 P-38s, that may catch him by surprise and really shoot up a bunch of his aircraft and do some serious damage. So that could be, that could be fun to watch. Um, we should also, some of these guys need to trans pull some of these troops out. So we had been pulling troops. Um, we've got some Catalinas here. Let's pull the SSV Brigade out. These are Malayan infantry squads. We have 31 Malayan infantry squads. So the only unit that's not restricted yet that I don't have to use political points on. So let's go ahead and use these Catalinas here to troop transport out of Sabang. We'll do pickup and the SSV. Set so all patrols in this squadron. So that should help pull these troops out as well. How many? So there's four Catalinas here and then another 13 here. These Catalinas would be better used elsewhere in the Pacific. So I really do need to get these guys out of Burma and onto some islands doing some patrols. But at least for the moment. Can we transport troops as far as Rangoon on these DC-2s? I don't think they have the range. Yeah, they don't. So, um, this is the Chinese Air Force, right? Yeah, so let's actually transfer these guys. We had sent them into Port Blair on these transports, but now that that's done, let's go ahead and fly these guys back to, I think, Lido. And then we're going to let them stand down today since we just did a transfer, but we are flying supplies out of Lido into China as well. So we're flying over the hump already with a lot of our bombing aircraft. Just because I don't have a ton of use for my bombers yet, I may move them back into Burma to try and hit the Japanese army as it starts to move up once uh, once we actually have... Why, why are these guys set to 30? What are they doing? Oh, they're training. Okay. Um, once the Japanese start moving up into Burma, I may use these bombers to try and slow them down, but they're not great bombing, uh, like ground attack aircraft at this stage. So mostly just using them for 
transport and whatnot uh, into uh, into China to help. Again, China has such massive supply problems that you really want to, at least in my opinion, I think losing some aircraft, transferring supply is worth it. You're never going to supply over the hump like the majority of Chinese forces, but every little bit helps. Uh, and so it could make the difference between holding for a couple of days and holding for a week or something somewhere. Try to get some recon on Japanese aircraft bases north of Rangoon. Um, yeah, so Chiang Mai is probably the one base that he would stage out of, I guess. He could stage out of Molmun also. Molmun and Chiang Mai are both close. He could stage out of either one of those. We do have some aircraft operating south at Pegu. Where's the rest of this unit? Um, but yeah, the one, one of the bad things at this point is that our air force is so concentrated in Rangoon. We've got what, how many aircraft here? 130 fighters out of Rangoon. That's a lot of aircraft at one base. If he caught us by surprise and hit our aircraft on the ground, he could really ravage them. Good thing is Rangoon's up a river, so we can't use battleships to bombard there. So we can't really like hit him too hard. Uh, he could move cruisers up that way, but I think we've got some coastal defense guns in some of these uh, base forces. Yeah, we've got some six-inch coastals, which might do okay against enemy cruisers if he tries to move up the river. Uh, Pegu is the base that's much more vulnerable to bombardment, uh, which is another reason I moved some of those troops south, is to disperse our ground forces a bit. Um, he could try and bypass Rangoon north through the, the mountains of Burma, but we do have some tripwires here, a battalion there of troops, and it's very difficult, slow going up bad roads through the mountains. So we'd at least have some heads up if he tried to do that. Yeah, mind, I mean, we, we can double check. Um, we probably should do some recon at least. Uh, do we have any? These guys are flying supply missions. And these guys over here are just training. Um, once this aircraft is repaired tomorrow, I'll move these other 16 hurricanes back west. Also, there's 16 more hurricanes at Lachau that'll kind of replace the, the aircraft that are going to be leaving soon as well. But let's do this. Do we have any, any of these bombers here? Maybe these Blenheims? Can they do, do recon over any of these Japanese bases? All right, so we'll fly some Blenheims over here on a recon mission over Chiang Mai to see if they can't tell us if there's any Japanese aircraft there. Um, and this guy, can he do a, a recon? No, oh, I can't. He's a, he's a night fighter, not a recon aircraft. What about... You can't do recon with load stars, right? No. Uh, P-39s? You can't do recons with fighters? Or recon with fighters? Oh, well, we've got a photo recon you here. They're flying out of Bangkok, but we might as well check out Molman, see what's there. We know there's 14 units there, but we'll fly uh, some of these photo recon uh, aircraft, some, what are they, Beauforts out of there. So we've got a recon mission ordered for both Molmun and Chiang Mai. That's fine. The Helen, the intent of these aircraft is to get them back up to 16. I'm not actually trying to train these guys. Uh, I'm just trying to get the aircraft all ready, get their maintenance done, and then we're going to fly them back into theater. Waifu Lord, thank you for the follow. All right, so that's the situation there. China, I don't have a lot to show other than Queenland's in a little bit of danger. We kind of showed the rest of these bases, and we are moving some troops uh, to some different locations in China. Um, we're holding out at Cyan, hopefully, effectively. We have some troops marching, I think, north. We want to make sure that he doesn't land at Kuching via paratroopers. So we've got, I think, some of these guys are moving to, I think, directly west to this dot base. And I think these other guys are moving north up here to make sure he doesn't land paratroopers in our rear. So they'll be one hex away tomorrow. Um, I think we also have some troops moving south, so the 9th Separate Brigade. Oh, no, they already arrived where they were going at Lengkau. Is that needed for a garrison? Not really. The base force is probably enough to prevent a paratrooper landing in our rear. Can these guys upgrade to anything better? Not really. These separate brigades are just infantry, basically. They do have some engineers. Maybe we should move them south to support Cyan. Um, yeah, we could send the 9th down to Cyan. 
Okay, so that's that. I guess really at this point, you know, we've there's not a lot else to show. We showed the American carriers. Uh, the battleships in Pearl are still repairing, or some of them are still repairing. We've got the California, Tennessee, the Oklahoma's almost almost done. Didn't we send our own battleships out somewhere? Because we landed on uh, on Baker Island, right? Where, where did I put my battleships? I don't even remember. Oh, why are these guys? I forgot that I sent like six battleships out to Tahiti. I guess with no with no aircraft, they were gonna bombard Baker Island if we needed them to. But we were able to land the first Marine Defense Battalion on Baker and retake that from the Japanese. As a reminder, the Japanese pushed very far east. They took Canton and Baker. It was a little bit of a hindrance potentially on our supply lines. They still have Canton. Seems they have two units there. Probably not quite as easy to take Canton as we took Baker. But we at least put a little bit of a counterattack in by taking Baker a few turns ago. Um, and now the battleships are pulling back to Tahiti. These guys probably shouldn't operate uh, in the Western Pacific. They just consume way too much fuel. Um, but at the moment, they're on their way to Tahiti. Where we've got some uh, oilers or whatever that are either there or on the way. Um... Uh, Penryn, I've got some troops there. We've built Penryn up to be a decent uh, defensive position. It's at level 3 fortifications. It's almost to level 4. Uh, and we've got uh, one engineer regiment here of about 63 AV. I think Japan's bonuses for like landing on hostile shores end on April 1st. So it, it makes them much less efficient at landing troops, which should help. We've reinforced Christmas Island and Palmyra for, from enemy attacks here. Um, with some some new units here. Uh, Palmyra is still a little bit vulnerable. Christmas Island is much more heavily defended. We've even gotten a, a Canadian infantry brigade there, although they're mostly uh, militia. Um, Baker, he could definitely retake, but it was more as sort of misdirection to hopefully shift his focus. Pago Pago is a very well-defended base here. 300 assault value with good American troops, Marines, and an irregular infantry regiment. Suva, as a reminder, 300 assault value, a crack New Zealand brigade here. Well, not crack, they're 45 experience, but they're regular infantry, they're not militia. Um, and then you've got the 161st Infantry Brigade of the U or Regiment of the U.S. ready here also, so some good U.S. troops there. Heavily dug in, some field artillery in support on Fiji as part of the Fiji Island. Level 4 fortifications working toward level 5. Nadi off on the west has the first Australian infantry divisions, mostly militia, uh, but still it's a full division that's been formed up. Um, and then the 7th Australian Brigade, uh, more militia as well. Um, and they also have some American field artillery support. Nadi isn't as well dug in. They're at level three forts working on level or level three working on four. Um, meanwhile, we've also landed troops at Vavu South. We have a Marine regiment on Vavu. Uh, which we're building up as well, because then that lets us transfer aircraft between Suva and Pago. Uh, that'll be helpful. We also landed some troops at Tungatapu, uh, a Marine base or U.S. base force. Uh, they're going to build up some fortifications here as well as the airfield. And then we've landed some troops at Raul, and we're turning that airfield into an operational airfield slowly. We're at 60% of the way there. Once this is turned into a full-fledged base, then we can transfer aircraft via island hopping uh, from New Zealand up to the Fiji line and from Australia to New Zealand or just ship them into New Zealand. So it'll make our uh, ability to, to sort of island hop aircraft around the Pacific much more efficient. Once Raul is up, we've got an air bridge up to the Fiji line for short-ranged fighters. Yeah, I mean, we could do like a paratrooper landing somewhere, maybe on some of these islands, if there's any unoccupied land islands. The only problem is these guys are so far away that I don't have the range on any of my transport aircraft to do it. I also don't have sufficient airlift at the moment, but at some point I will. Uh, so that's about it. Let's go ahead and check out some other information here. So ship sunk last turn uh, two. We lost the Merula, which is a pretty valuable Dutch tanker here. And we lost the Ipswich, both the Japanese submarines. Um, if we take a look at total aircraft or total shipping lost in the game so far, uh, if we take a look at the value, we claimed the Congo was sunk. But it was only hit by like one 500-pound bomb, so I really think this is fog of war. But we do know we sank the Haruna, so we sank one Japanese battleship, the Haruna, off the coast of Malaya. The heaviest ship we've lost so far in game is the Houston, only 35 points. Uh, that was, again, near Malaya. 
Uh, we did also lose several troop transports, the President Coolidge being the most valuable, the subtender Otis. Several tankers have been lost. The Japanese have lost a couple of AMCs and some light cruisers. We've also lost a light cruiser. But you can see here, not a ton of heavy shipping lost. The uh, Prince of Wales and the Repulse both survived. We didn't send them on their suicide charge. They did suffer some very heavy damage in some surface actions south of Malaya, though. Uh, and so the Prince of Wales is about 272 days away from being repaired. She's still being worked on in the dockyards of uh, Colombo, or I guess Cape Town, sorry. And uh, the Repulse is about a month and a half away from being repaired, uh, currently being repaired in South Africa as well, uh, in the shipyard there. Um, but good, to no good news is we'll have the battle cruiser repulse back in about uh, 45 days. So that's exciting news. Um, and then just a lot of logistics and convoys moving around. But um, that's, uh, that's where we're at. No battleships were lost at Pearl. No, they were, they were damaged. So there were definitely battleships damaged at Pearl. As we showed here, the California and the Tennessee, they're both going to be about a, a little bit less than a year still before either one of them is ready. So we're going to be into you know early, early 43 before we get those ships out. Uh, we also did pull some battleships back to the U.S. to get repaired. The Pennsylvania is about five months away from being repaired still. Um, so the ship suffered some heavy damage, but we had nothing that was critically sunk. He lost 40 zeros at Pearl Harbor. Remember, XTRG made the mistake of sending those guys in at 100 feet to strafe, which, like, kind of makes sense. But actually, if you send the fighters in at, like, 10,000 or 15,000, they will dive down to strafe and they will avoid a lot of flack. If you send them in on the deck to begin with, they lose a lot more attrition because they're just exposed to flack the entire time rather than diving into attack. Maryland will be ready in three days. That'll be good. Uh, we'll get her back into action. Also, she's also been upgraded to have radar, so that's good. Uh, the Arizona is only about 40 days away from being back. So... We've got two battleships ready here in the next month and a half. We've got the Oklahoma, which took a torpedo on the way to a bombardment mission of Midway, which is a reminder, Midway did fall. Um, so she's about four days away. So two more battleships on the U.S. East Coast are about ready. The Oklahoma will be ready. That's three battleships. We've got six battleships at sea uh, south on their way toward Tahiti, um, wherever I was looking over here. So we've got nine battleships in the eastern and central Pacific uh, in the next month, month and a half. So pretty strong striking force. The main problem we have there is they just eat so much goddamn fuel uh, that makes it very hard to operate with the limited number of tankers that we have. Oh, and the West Virginia will be ready in about three months as well. So our battleships are almost almost back, uh, almost ready for, for using here. So that's the situation now. We've been streaming for about an hour, guys, but I don't have a lot else to show for War in the Pacific at the moment. Um, that's kind of, you know, the situation here. Um, we're in uh, late March 42. Uh, we're almost ready to start fighting, <laughs> I would say. We've mostly been Sir Robining. We've had a couple of sedans, Singapore held. Uh, let's take a look at Bataan, actually. We haven't looked at Bataan yet. So you can see we've got about 2,000 assault value in Bataan. Supply situation's starting to get bad, actually. It's not as good as I'd hoped. So we've got 11,000 supply left. It says we require 32,000. Uh, that's just because we upped the supplies to the max to try and get all of the supplies to flow into Bataan. None of these units' supply is bad. Um, you know, all of the units still have more than 100% of what they need. So if we were to launch an attack, it would be an effective attack. I don't know what's opposing me here. We know there's two units. I'm guessing they're two infantry divisions, but I could be wrong. Um, I think we were actually, didn't we bombard them a while back and we saw they were infantry divisions? So we could counterattack very likely, and we could probably drive the Japanese out of Bataan back to Clark Field. I think the question is to what point, like what... What would that give us um, that would actually be beneficial? Uh, also, I do have some Catalinas flying out of Batan to try and see what shipping might be in the area. So I did fly some Catalinas up to Batan to try and get some recon. My thought was, if I get some Catalinas up here, I might be able to see what convoys are moving around, and then I could send uh, subs forward to try and attack them. Um, but... So far, not much has been detected. Oh, by the way, we're also still holding at Kaigan in the south. These guys are in critical supply. Their situation is desperate. They've held off against multiple enemy attacks here down at Mindanao, but um, their their supply situation is, is getting bad. So the Japanese will likely take Mindanao before too long. Um, 
a lot of other isolated bases all in bad supply here, Cebu and other places like that in, in the southern Philippines. But Batan, I would imagine, can still hold out for a couple more weeks. Again, I could attack him and drive these troops back, but I'm not going to destroy whatever he has here. If I do attack, I'll probably burn like half of my remaining supply. I'd probably lose four to 500 assault value. And it would all it would do is, is shorten the amount of time that my troops will survive at Batan. Maybe it would force him to divert a division to Batan to take it. I doubt it. He doesn't have to. He can just starve me out. So at this point, I don't think a counterattack at Batan makes a lot of sense. But we'll think about it. Anyway, guys, the stream went on for about another 20 minutes, but it was mostly just me digging into some statistics and some upcoming ships. So if you're interested in that, check out the Twitch channel. The link is in the description. You can see the past broadcasts. With that being said, I am going to go ahead and wrap this one up here at about an hour. Hope you guys enjoyed the video, the return to War in the Pacific. Merry Christmas once again to all of you who celebrate it. Happy holidays to everybody else. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I'm out.